2 Timothy 4.10. 4 okay, 2 Timothy 4.10. 2 Timothy 4.10, all right, let's do it. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Lord God, we pray you open up our hearts and minds to receive this word. We want to be good soil. We pray we only hear your word. We only receive your doctrine. Correct us, Holy yes. Spirit, in any misunderstandings, sure. either in the receipt or the pronounce, uh, pronouncing of this word, God. Mm -hmm. And we pray, Holy Spirit, you take us and heal us. We trust you. And we bless the people receiving today, including myself. In Jesus' name, we pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's, uh, this verse is very interesting to me. Um, for Demas, that's a friend of Paul's, or it was a friend of Paul's, uh, in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. If you look up Demas, D-E-M-A-S, in the Bible, he'll come up, I think, three times, and uh, three or four times. And in all but this instance, he's hanging out with Paul. He's one of his standby men. And... Uh, he, the, Demas is one of them sending greetings to the churches. In other words, he's up at the, the, the top-notch places with Paul. But he gets to this point. Paul's in some trouble. He might have had some legal issues about preaching the gospel, going to jail, and that sort of thing. I'm, and Demas has had enough of it. He's tired of being poor. Wouldn't that be an interesting thing for ministers if every minister... <laughs> He's tired of being with threadbare uh, clothing. He's tired of having to work to do ministry, right? Because Paul made tents, and he tried to not be a burden on other people. And in, in fact, that's interesting because in Thessalonica, he's, he told people, he said, you know, you have to work. And, and they labored day and night. That's how Paul did the ministry. He was worn out. I'm sure Demas was worn out. He was tired of rejection. He was tired of being rejected by his relatives and by the Jews and by everybody else. Or it's probably a Greek name. So, But rejected by people who are not believers. And he said, I've had it. It's a lot easier if I stop this ministry stuff and I just hang out. I was talking to uh, someone in my... Uh, that I know who's a successful manager in the contract world. And this person works constantly. I mean, 80 hours a week. Now, I know she makes probably two and a half what I make, you know, but I'm not underpaid by any means. Uh, but I'm th thinking, you know, it was, it's this temptation to think, well, if I didn't have the church and I put myself into work like that person did, man, I'd have boatloads of money, you know? But I'm thinking, you know, my mind is not thinking about, sorry, it's not thinking about work all the time. <laughs> you know, I turn it off when I go home and I'm, even at work, I'm thinking about ministry. I'm thinking about you guys. I'm thinking about the sermon. It's constant. So I am not able to fully focus the way that this person is. The temptation's there to say, wow, man, I could really be rich. I could do this really well. <clears throat> but that's, that's a short term. That's a short term part of your life is that working part. And God gives you no credit <laughs> unless you're using your money and your work for the kingdom of God. You get nothing back for it. It's a zero. You, well, you could buy a, a nice car and that's fun for a little while, but that's not, he's not giving you credit for driving a nice car. After our accident, I lost all interest in cars. I, seriously, I lost, I, I love that car. And after that car accident, I thought, I don't even want to be in a car. These things have no value to me anymore. It's just to get me, hopefully, safely, and without a ticket from one place to another. <laughs> um, but I, at, I remember driving that car and loving it, really. And I'm thinking, hmm, the only thing I would like better is a Tesla. I, think, I would like to have a Tesla. And I, I have to admit, I was looking online. <laughs> at Tesla. But after this, it's like, forget it. It's valueless. It has nothing. Nothing. Nothing is there. But Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. You know, in ministry, the hardest thing to deal with is when people leave you. You, you, because if you're really ministering to people, you're doing it out of love. You're giving everything you got to try to help them. And then when they say, eh, 
I don't really like you. <laughs> or I want to go to this church over here. I just, you know, I just rather hang out with my friends than go to church. It, it, I can't explain to you, but it's like someone dying, you know, and, and, or worse. It's like a divorce. Someone you loved and then they left. That's what it feels like. Uh, so I can imagine the pain that Paul had when Demas just bolted. Um, but Paul was on a long journey, and it wasn't a sprint. You know, he spent years ministering the gospel, and he had tons of pain and, and disappointments. Demas was just another one on, on the long list of people that, that were false brothers or people that abandoned him. He started his mission out with Mark. Remember, Mark went on the mission trip, and he bolted too. And then he was, Paul was getting ready for a second mission trip, and they brought up Mark and said, hey, you want to take him? He said, no. <laughs> no, he left me. Because he was hurt. Paul was hurt. Not just did he not trust him in the, as a missionary, he didn't trust him as a friend anymore. Well, thank God that Paul uh, was forgiving and, and Mark was restored because he also was an author of one of the Gospels. But that's an example of what Paul went through. In fact, you know, he says he lost his mind one time when he starts running down all of the pain he had. He was whipped. He was flogged. He was shipwrecked. He was naked. I don't know how that happened, but it <laughs> certainly must not have been. Maybe one of those trips into the prison, they took all his clothes or something. Uh, he, he says, false brothers. And then he says, on top of all of this, I have the burden of all the churches. Now, just Peter was filling in for me when I was gone. I hope you don't mind me. Uh, <laughs> and he said, how can you do this every, every week? Be you know, because you have to be mindful of what God's saying and of each person. And you're putting your whole heart into it, which he did. And I know he was up late at night doing his sermons and things. And even this today, you were up late at night. I know that. But at the same time, I know Peter has got some things going on in his life. And he is contending with that. And that's ministry. That's being a Christian. You never get off easy, baby. <laughs> and when you want to serve God, you've got to give something. You're giving everything. It's not just dancing up in front of people, telling a story and, you know, taking all the credit. You're going to deal with personal, and you're dealing with satanic attacks, not just normal problems. But you will experience that too. When you start to witness to your family, to your girlfriend, to your, you know, whoever it is, you're going to get pounded. And, this, and then the temptation is, as we we're talking today, I just want to compromise. I want to give on it. I don't want this uh, relationship to go bad. I'll give up what I can to keep the relationship and hopefully keep God. It doesn't work that way. Not well. But Paul was on a process. He didn't do his ministry all in one week. This was years. And he finally got to the point where he won the prize because he was put in prison. And they killed him. That's the reward, Paul. And then a lot of people abandoned him. And a lot of other pastors talked bad about him. And a lot of other pastors competed with him. And some churches lost their loyalty to Paul. And what was he doing at the end? He wasn't cursing them. He was praying for them. Because God had put him through this long journey of making him like Jesus. When Paul, when Paul started off, he was Saul. He was an arrogant man. He was a religious man. And maybe even potentially violent in, some, in, in the sense of a religiosity. He had to go from that, that God had to wash all of that stuff, all that Judaism out of him, all of the legalism out of him, and uh, all of his pride had to be taken away to get him to the point where he was looking like Christ in that prison cell, praying for people that backstabbed him and deserted him. And that's the journey that you should be on, and I should be on. It doesn't happen in a week. <laughs> Paul just didn't say, yes, Lord, you know, take me, and he's cleaned up, and he's ready. You know, no, he was passionate for God from the moment he met Jesus. He was passionate, and he was obedient, but he wasn't complete. There's a man named Noah. My wife had a dream. Was it a dream? A vision. A vision. Yes. And it was... Uh, she saw that Noah had built the ark, 
But uh, during that process, he was obeying God, but nobody was supporting him. Everybody was against him. And, uh, but he had to finish the job. And when she said that to me, I had the, that same impression come upon me. And uh, I started to pray about it, and, and God uh, was um, leading me on a little journey there. Um, but it really struck me that it took Noah a long time to build that ark. It was 450 feet long. I mean, this thing was gigantic, three levels. It was a lot of work. In fact, it's, it probably took him... Well, he completed it about 100 years after he was told to build it. So that gives you an idea. I don't know if it, he worked on it every day. He's probably got some other job going, you know, he's got to feed the family. So in his free time, he's in there hammering nails into an ark with his sons. Now, it, <clears throat> the, uh, the Lord says that the whole world was wicked, but Noah walked with God. Now, it doesn't say that Noah went out and preached like uh, Jesus did. It doesn't say that. His job was to build the ark. Now, God must have known how many people were going to be on that ark because he told them a hundred years in advance how big to make it. It wasn't like, well, maybe these people will repent and they'll line up and I, oh, now I've got to make the ark bigger. Oh, we've got to start over again. I didn't know he was going to come. You know, who would have thought he would repent? I mean, I, you know. No, he, God knew how many animals were going to be on there. He knew that it was going to be Noah. It was going to be those eight people or whatever. And, um, and all Noah had to do was just obey God for all those years. Now, what if he got tired in the middle? What about a 50-year point? He built half the ark. He's at 225 feet. Oh, man, I'm just... I'm just tired of this. I don't even know why I'm doing this. I, I don't know why God told me to build this thing. Right? I mean, everybody else is out there making money and having a good time. And on my weekends and at nighttime, I'm doing ministry. I mean, I'm building an ark. An ark. <laughs> I'm building an ark. You see, that was what God was telling me with that. You may look at your manage your friends and see how much money they're making in their 80 hours, all the time they're putting into the love of this world. But I'm putting more than that into ministry. I'm putting it into people. I'm putting it into the Word of God. I'm putting it into prayer and worship. Right? So these things, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it on my weekends and after hours. I'm building an ark. You are building an ark. You've been given orders to build an ark. You don't know it, maybe. And you've got a set period of time to finish it. Now that ark represents someone. Jesus. The ark represents Jesus. And getting into the ark is your salvation. The waters come, it's going to wipe away all wickedness and evil. But the one who's on the ark, who finished the ark, not who just started building the ark, you got a few planks put together. Forty days and forty nights on a plank of wood with lots of wood uh, water coming down. You don't have any food in the ark because you didn't make it. You didn't finish the top, so it's got to be filled with water, and you're going to sink. You didn't finish the bottom, so you got holes. The sides got a missing piece. Noah had to finish the ark. He had to build this thing for a long time. Our walk with Jesus. Our walk with the Lord is a long walk, hopefully, unless you're the thief on the cross, and it's a quick one. But let's just say we're not on the cross right now. <clears throat> Each day we wake up, and we look at the ark, and maybe it's not finished yet. I, I'm building Jesus into my life. I'm becoming like Jesus, and I, and I need to obey all the way with God. We did 2 Corinthians 6, 17-18. And Paul gives us some reminders uh, of what we need to do. Uh, he says, come out from the midst, come out from among them. Separate yourself from them. Touch no unclean thing. And then I will welcome you and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Right? Am I out? Am I still in the world? Am I working on the ark? 
Or am I just making money? Am I just worried about my next Mercedes Benz? Am I just working on this and that? Am I just working on my next girlfriend, my next boyfriend? What, my job. See, that, that stuff, the love of the world will stop you. It'll stop you from building the ark that you need to be on. It'll stop you from becoming like Jesus Christ. And all of the pain, all of the sacrifice that's required to build that ark, it's part of your character development. The biggest mistake I see in charismatic churches is that, I, I think I've talked to you about this before, but people think if you come up and you pray about something for me, I will be that. One guy wanted to be a drummer. So he saw this great drummer at this church we used to visit every now and then. And he, and he, went, he comes up to the drummer and says, pray for me so I can be a drummer like you. There's no character development. There's no skill development. Just pray for me because I don't want to do the work. You've got to do the work. Character issues. I can pray for someone to receive a gift. I've prayed for people, and they never prophesied before in their life. I prayed for them to prophesy that God said that they will prophesy, and they get up and start prophesying over the people in the room. That's different. That's a, that's, a, that's a spiritual gift. Gift. I gave it to you. The fruit of the Spirit, we talked about that. Those character issues to become like Jesus, that has to be done over time. Something you've got to work on. Something you've got to work on with God. And it comes through obedience. I don't want to have holes in my ark because I love the world. Paul was unique because he was able to put all that aside. Demas was not. Who knows what happened to Demas? And Paul says, so I'll listen to Paul. If Demas wrote a book, I'm going to throw that in the trash. But if Paul wrote a book, and he did by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to listen to what Paul says. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Have you given up? I see a spirit of sleepiness on some people. Not right this now. But I, I see it often where people, they can't stay awake in, when I'm preaching until like be mad at me. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, an anointed preaching, a word from God... Uh, you, you know, if I see everybody else wide awake and then this one's going, oh, it's a spirit. And they got to get rid of that. It's funny because I've prayed for people that have this spirit. Sometimes I'll be doing deliverance and then all of a sudden the person goes to sleep. Do you know how loud I pray? <laughs> how could you go to sleep with me praying like that? In the name of Jesus, get out! I mean, you're going to fall asleep? <laughs> and they do. So then I know it's a spirit. The Spirit puts them to sleep so they can't receive the ministry and they can't get healed. I see it in churches. And, and they'll just... And then afterwards you say, were well, you feeling all right? I'm fine. Oh, uh, I thought you might be a little tired. No, I was fine. They don't even know they were asleep. But you... Now that's a, that's a very obvious spiritual manifestation, but, but are you sleeping in some part of your life? Because you're in love with the world. Am I? I don't want to go to sleep. Well, my understanding with the carbon monoxide poisoning is that you can start to smell it, but if you don't stop breathing it, you're going to die. You just kind of go to sleep. Like gas out of an oven. You know, you just get tired and then you're dead. That, that is to me what's happening to us when we are not awake, we're not spiritually awake, and Satan is just putting this gap. You, I smell something. I've got sin in my life. I've got a, a disinterest in the Word of God. I have a disinterest in prayer. I have a disinterest in Jesus. That should be a little bit of a noxious fume for you. I don't care if I'm in church or what I hear. He can talk all he wants. Uh, it's just, I have to be there. That, that you're going to sleep. The gas is starting to come into your nostrils. And then don't let it take you away. Don't let your families, your friends, why are you going to church? Why are you praying? Why are you doing this? And I, I shared that story in the, in the uh, Bible study today 
uh, about a friend of ours who was so passionate. I, I mean, weeping on the ground, uh, crying out to God, growing, praying for people, witnessing to everybody. But the husband dragged her down. And I said, watch him. <clears throat> I told you this, I'm not going to repeat the whole story, but, but now she struggles so much spiritually. She said, I can't pray. She can't even pray anymore because of the, the smell of the carbon monoxide starting to put her to sleep. I said, don't, I had warned her, don't let that person bring you down. It's better to cut yourself off from them. Don't listen to them. They're killing you. They're putting gas into your nostrils. You're the one on Judgment Day. Don't let someone else take you down with them. That's loving the world. We have to love God till the very end. Mm -hmm. Don't grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. You can't give up. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says you can stop or you can give up. You can go halfway. Paul said, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? Who is weak and I am not weak? It's not about being strong. It's about not giving up. Stand firm and the devil will lead you. Don't give up. That's, this is the battle we're in. Don't stop. Keep going. Paul said, I press on to get the prize. I don't look back. I look forward. I'm not looking back at all my screw-ups, my messes. I'm looking forward because that's where the prize is. Don't give up. Don't give up when you're sick. Don't give up when you're tired. Don't give up when you've been falsely accused. Don't give up when your relatives don't like your message. Don't give up. We're all weak. We all suffer. It's not about comfort. Comfort is sleeping in the back of the van during the Holocaust. <laughs> Fight, get out, break the door, bite the guard. I don't know, but get out of that thing. Don't let them just drive you off and, and put noxious fumes down your throat. Paul said, for his sake, for Jesus' sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, as trash, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. The reason that Noah finished the ark is because he had faith, not because he was perfect. The minute he got out of the out of the ark and, and uh, they started growing crops, he grew grapes. I'm sorry, he was a little heavy in his soul. He drank a little too much of the grape. And he was naked, got drunk. Is Noah perfect? No. No, but it says he walked with God. Now that sin cost him. I mean, he was embarrassed, obviously. Kind of hurts your testimony. I'm Noah. I built the ark. You're naked. You're drunk and you're naked. What kind of a, kind of a prophet are you? <laughs> hurts your testimony. And just because you made it through some big things with God doesn't mean you can lay down and get drunk and go naked. You know, Noah still had some work to do. He had some boys to or young, These were grown men, I shouldn't say boys. He could, you know, one of them could have used a little uh, ministry there. <laughs> There's another man, David. What an awesome dude he was. Here's, here's the danger. David was amazing when you had a giant. Oh, I'm not afraid of you. I can see you with my eyes. When he wanted a woman, he killed 200 Philistines, even though Saul said, you kill 100 Philistines and bring me their foreskins. No problem. I'll make it 200. He loved women. Remember when Samuel came and said, the next king of Israel is one of your sons, Jesse. Pulls everybody out but David. You don't think David feels a little rejected? He wasn't even on the list, on his father's list. The father didn't love David the way he loved these other dudes. Do you think David didn't know that? Did you know that? Maybe you had a father who didn't love you. He wasn't around. You weren't high on his list. He had other things to do. Maybe he was drinking grape with uh, Noah. 
chasing women, whatever. Who am I? Am I important? I didn't have my father, mother put me up for adoption. David had something in him, I believe, because why? Because I've been through this. When you don't have the love of your father, you can get kind of mean with people. I, I used to be angry with people. Violent. If you asked me back when I was younger if I would <laughs> take somebody out, I had no problem with it. You know, I, I would, kind of, some of us in the military probably went through that too. But it wouldn't have bothered me. I had no conscience about it. I didn't mind smacking somebody or interrogating somebody or whatever it was. But when God came, he started to heal things inside me. <clears throat> I started to recognize God as my father. But this is a long journey. It's like building that ark. It took, it's taken a long time. I'm still, still parts of me that are, you've mentioned, there's still a little crust there, a little wound there. You know, people say, well, I'll forgive him. Okay, well, the guy beat me every day for, you know, 20 years. <laughs> I'll, I'll forgive him, but it's not easy. I've chosen to forgive, but I have a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. But it takes time to heal. It takes time to become godly. It takes time to forgive fully. I think David had that problem. He's looking for love. So he's looking for these women. He's a warrior because he wants to prove himself because daddy liked all of the other brothers more than him. So now he's got to be the man and he's got to go out and knock these people around. Well, when he's 50 years old, David loved God. And David knew God. He knew God loved him. But he wasn't completely healed. How do I know? Because he's lusting after Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Why? He's got all these other women. What does he need her for? Well, it's this conquest type of thing. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Trying to prove yourself, right? And uh, you think he's got it made. Well, uh, he sleeps with her, commits adultery with her, gets her pregnant. Doesn't it, you know, things start going bad when you're bad. And then uh, has her husband killed, who is a loyal follower, a loyal soldier. He's the one who committed adultery. And he's 50. And he's been walking with God since he was a young boy. Now how, how does this happen? Because it's a long journey. It's a long time to build that ark. It's a long time for God to heal us sometimes. David was never completely healed. If he was completely healed, he wouldn't have done that. He would have been out there fighting. He would have been uh, obeying the laws of Israel, which said... Uh, you shouldn't be sleeping with women while you're at war, which is what Uriah was obeying when he didn't sleep with his wife. And David said, why don't you sleep with your wife to cover up my sin? But Uriah says, no, I'm not going to sleep with her. Our laws say that we're not supposed to sleep with a woman while we're fighting, while we're at war. But David tried to get him to sin, trying to cover his own sin. He just cared about himself. He's very selfish at this point. And... Uh, he had forgotten the love of the Father. If, if we don't have the love of the Father from the time we're young, and we, we re, you know, it's a long journey getting to know our Father and our Father. And David's on that journey, so he doesn't have the love of Jesse, but he's got the love of God. But during this long process, in order to have the love of God properly flow into his life, he has to repent, he has to get healed, and it doesn't matter if you're the king of Israel and you're David and you're a great warrior and all that. It does not matter. You've got to deal with your inner hurts. You've got to deal with the wounds inside you or you're going to be screwed up and you're going to screw somebody else up. So come out from their midst. Touch no unclean things. Separate yourself from all the evil stuff. David didn't do it. But the condition of God being his father and him being a son and a, a son uh, is that he needed to come out. So when we keep living in the world, we keep living in sin, we keep live, desiring the things that do not have to do with God, we don't get the love of the Father. It's the love of the Father. It's not just the fear. Do you think David knew to fear sin? I mean, back then they could still kill you for adultery, right? He's under the Old Covenant. 
it wasn't that enough to stop him from doing this? No. Nowadays we don't stone for adultery, right? Now, if I said we're going to stone you because you commit adultery, would you think twice about of adultery? I mean, that's going to cut down on a lot of adultery <laughs> if they're going to kill you for it, right? It's not going to stop it altogether, though. It'll still happen, and uh, you'll still have lust in your heart, by the way. But what would have helped David is to remember the Father's love, to remain in the Father's love. Now, when he sinned, Nathan, God was gracious, sends Nathan to him and says, Hey, the Lord told me you sinned. Now, Nathan couldn't have known that any other way. This is another valuable lesson about prophecy and words of knowledge. Because if someone releases to you a, a hidden thing going on in your heart, a hidden sin, hidden issue, that's how your cousin got saved when we were in Vietnam last year. So, uh, the, the last day we were in Vietnam, we uh, sharing the gospel with her cousin. And uh, and then we said, can we pray for you? She said, okay. She's a Buddhist. She's got huge statues in her home. And the Lord showed me an issue she was suffering from that nobody else knew. So I said, you have this problem. And she started crying right away. She prayed to receive Jesus Christ. She said, how did he know that? And then my wife said, God told her. So she repents. She got saved, baptized that night. Next year, her husband got saved and baptized. And it's related to that as well. I, I just make this story short. The power, the power of a word from God can lead to multiple salvations. I, I, I mean, I've got so many stories about this. But it's for me too. If someone comes up, to, my wife has a dream and said there's a problem here. She came to me the other night. She had a dream about something that I, I needed to deal with that might have been generational. So I said, okay, pray for me. Pray for I didn't have, to, you know, I'm not going to say, no, I'm fine. I'm the pastor. What are you talking about? I don't have any problems. I don't have any issues. Look at me. Yes, you do have a problem. Yes, King David, you do have a problem. And yes, we do need to hear from the Lord to tell us Something's hidden. Something stinks. Something needs to go. Because if not, that sin will manifest. And that's what happened to David. Now, if we stay in the love of God, I don't want to violate the love. But when I forget the love of the Father, it's so easy for me to sin. The threat, God's wrath won't even stop me from sinning. But if I really have a love relationship with God, my Father, I don't want to break it. So here's the danger. If, that's why Jesus says in Revelation, I like all this stuff you guys are doing, but return to your first love. Yeah. Amen. Because that's what keeps it. Yes, there is the wrath of God. Yes, there is a judgment day. But that stuff won't stop you from sinning. What will stop you from sinning is really loving God. Feeling and knowing the love of the Father. And knowing He loves you. And that you're valuable to Him. That you're a son. You're a daughter. That He died for you. That there's a price He paid for you. Do you want the relationship? What broke David wasn't the fact that he was going to have all these problems. And he did. God didn't let him off the hook. But what broke David was, this is the one who loved me. My father didn't even love me. My wife didn't love me. If you read the story, he was rejected over and over again. But he loved me, and I ignored him, and I didn't appreciate him. I didn't live for him. I lived for my own lust, and I forgot about him. <clears throat> this is where we need to go. Two commandments. Love God with all your heart. Love him with everything you got, and then love one another. That's why. Because once we get into the love part, the other stuff starts to fall into yes. place. We have a real relationship with our Father, a real relationship with God. Now, I don't want to sin. But if I don't have any relationship with Him, I don't miss anything. I can sin and it doesn't bother me. I can do whatever I want, it doesn't bother me. And I can stand here and preach to you, come out from among them. Don't touch any unclean thing. Separate yourself. And you go, that's, that, that's good. That's good. Uh, I, I need to get a, a beer right now. So let me... <laughs> I'm going to get mad at my husband today. He needs it. He hasn't been beaten up for a while. 
We won't stop sinning. We've got to learn to love God. And, and when we can't worship Him, it's a block on the love. Now, how do you do this? Talk to Him. David spent time alone out in the, in the shepherd field talking to God. He didn't sit there reading Bibles, okay? I mean, we do want to read Bibles, please. Don't get me wrong. But the relationship comes from talking and spending time with God, meditating on Him. And meditate Him on what, when you're worshiping. He should be coming alive to you when you worship. Worship should be one of your most exciting, best parts of your day and every day. I, I try not to leave the house without singing a worship song. When I go to work, I put my headphones on and, and I'll listen to sermons and worship songs. It's not the same thing. It's different before I leave my house. It's different when I can meditate and spend real alone time with God. And then I, He manifests to me. He becomes real to me by uh, uh, revelation. Uh, uh, a spiritual revelation. That's what you need. If He's still a thought, God's out here. You're not... You're not getting it. You're still on the roof with David looking over at Bathsheba. No, you, we got to get the love. we got to get the relationship. we got to get the intimacy. Whenever we're talking about some problems that we had, especially with traffic issues, when I have a problem, or if I'm even if I'm going to work and I think I'm going to be a little late or something, I'm dad, father. That's the moment I have to admit that, you know, help me, dad. Get in the habit of saying, Father, help me. Dad, help me. Whenever you got a problem. He doesn't have a problem with that. Because I can tell you so many times, I, I'm ready to uh, worry about something. And when I say, Father, help me. Dad, help me. And then I'm just remembering that he's, he loves me like a son. Keep doing that. It's a practice of meditation. It's a practice of recognition. You should never feel alone. You should, he's with you in the car. He's with you when you're studying. He's with you when you work. Father is with me. That's when people, I see people getting worried about stuff. It's fearful and this burden keeps coming and they're depressed and they keep, oh, this person's doing this and it, it's ongoing. They're not going to the Father. They're just worrying about the problem. If you're with the Father, you know Father's helping you. Father sees this. Father's listening to you. Father's going to help. Father is God. <laughs> he is God. He's not some dude. He's not a neighbor. You know, he, he's got the power. Amen. I mean, that song is like, He's got the power. Amen. He's got the power. That's your father. If you now come out from non believers, don't think like them. Anything that takes away your faith, come away from it. Get away from it. It's your faith, because you can't visualize the love of God without faith. You can't recognize Him. He's just a God. <laughs> you need Him. You need His love. You need the experience of Jesus and the Father's love. Okay. The mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. David screwed up. God still loved him. Loved him. David repented. David wanted love of God more than he wanted lust. He didn't want to hide his sin anymore. He wanted to get right with God. He wanted that father again. The only one that's ever really loved him was God. And it's true for us. Let's come back to him. David could kill a giant, but he couldn't kill his own lust. He couldn't get away from that temptation that destroyed him, nearly destroyed him, and destroyed every life, other lives. Remember, uh, Derek Prince has a saying that um, Satan can come like a dragon that you can see clearly, like Goliath. Or he can come like a python, a snake that comes up the bathroom pipe. The big sin, the big obvious stuff, don't become a Muslim. Okay, that's, you know, if Muslims are handing out tracts and say, you want to join our club? Yeah. Do you want to be a Satanist? Here, come. <laughs> so that's pretty clear. But what about the lust? Mm -hmm. What about your love for work more than God? What about your pride? What about the greed? What about hatred and unforgiveness? What about being busy and not thinking about God? 
So that's the snake up the pipe. And that's what got David. And it'll get you too. Get me too. All right. So um, let's just pray. And uh, I, I, I ask you guys <clears throat> to begin this process that I, I want to reflect more and more on myself. But uh, let's, let's begin praying at home about the love of God. You know, you got to ask Him to show you stuff sometimes. It's not just reading the Bible. That's the starting point. But then you got to ask Him, God, I don't feel your love. Would you please show it to me? Can I feel it? And it may be more than one prayer. <laughs> right? And before I got filled with the Holy Spirit, it was months on my knees crying, right? So uh, you don't know. But start. Start the process. Let's do it now. Lord Jesus, Lord, please take this this word, God, and make it real to us. But not just, we just don't want to just study. We want to experience. Lord, we can't live a holy life without your love, without really having it. Lord, this is something spiritual that I can't really see, and I need you to make it real to me. I may not have been loved by my Father the way I want it to be, or other people. But I know, I believe your promises. I believe what you're saying, that you do love me. You love me like a son. I want that to be the most valuable, or daughter, I want that to be the most valuable thing in my life. That I don't let sin, selfishness, pride, whatever it is, other people, other desires, the love of this world, I don't want that to come between the two of us anymore, God. I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of it, Lord. And Lord, I've been struggling with some issues. Issue. I know this is keeping me from you and it's making me turn to other things. But Lord, I, I don't want that anymore. I repent. I repent of loving these other things. I repent. And I ask you, Lord, I ask you, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to know you. Help me to know how you feel about me. Lord, heal me from the absence of my Father or these other people and their love that's lacking. I pray, Father, that you guide me as a son. Not just rules, but I want the relationship. I want to know you all day long. I want to know you. And, and whenever I'm doing something that's taking my attention away from you, Father, I ask you to bring me back. Even if it's painful, I want to come back. I don't want to hate anybody, but I want to separate myself from things and people that's stopping me from loving you and experiencing your love. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray blessings over my brothers and sisters here today. I pray, God, you fill each one of us with your love, a fresh baptism in love. And just have the peace of knowing our Father loves us, is protecting us, watching over us. Lord, your word says you do not slumber or sleep. You never take your eyes off us. And Jesus, you're our intercessor. You're praying for us all the time. It's hard for us to understand, but you can pray for every single person at the same time all the time and never stop. It's not something we understand, but it's real. Thank you for looking at my life, Jesus. Thank you for praying about my life. Thank you for praying that I will be strong against the enemy, that I will not fall into temptation, that just as you prayed for Peter not to fall into temptation, Lord, I know you're praying for me and my brothers and sisters that we will not fall into temptation and that we will be strengthened and that we will overcome and that we will love you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Yes, Lord, I love you. Lord, you know I love you. Of course, Lord, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> if anybody wants prayer, I'm more than happy to pray.